Well, welcome class to uh, Advanced Aircraft Systems lecture number 10. This is covering brakes and landing gear. We're getting closer, guys. We're getting closer to the end of systems. So try to hang in there with me and uh, we'll get through this. It's not too difficult, uh, but uh, let's get started here today. Landing gear and brakes. All right, uh, landing gear and brakes. Uh, we'll cover mostly uh, what is uh, on the CRJ 700. We'll talk a little bit in detail about the brakes in general, uh, kind of just how the brake drums work, that kind of stuff. I think it's kind of an interesting subject to understand. Uh, kind of fascinated me a little bit. Not really all that much different uh, than your uh, disc brakes on your Cessna 172 or, or light aircraft. Uh, just a lot bigger and has a lot more uh, disc and brakes and rotors and stagers, that kind of stuff. But we'll break it down, make it fairly simple for you. Landing gear and brakes. The major components include the following, landing gear, nose wheel steering, and brakes. That's how simple this module is going to be. On the CRJ700, there are three hydraulic systems, as you've learned in the hydraulics uh, module. They are designated as hydraulic system number one, two, and three. The great news today, folks, is that you don't have to even pay attention to system number one. System number one is out, not required, doesn't have anything to do with brakes or um, you know, brakes or, or uh, retracting the gear or anything. However, system number three and system number two are vital to the operation of the brakes. And actually system number three is the main uh, system that uh, is uh, really important to the brakes. System number two is kind of a backup system. So if anybody asks you what uh, controls the hydraulic, uh, the brakes and the uh, landing gear operations on the CRJ700, always answer system number three is your primary and you can say system number two is a pseudo backup. Okay, so system number one does not have input into either the landing gear operation or aircraft braking. System number two uh, has input into the left and right outboard brakes only. And they also have input into the left and right main landing gear and nose landing gear assist actuators. And those are assisting actuators. If you ever had to drop the gear and uh, let it come down by gravity, then those, uh, those actuators would jump into action to help make sure that the gear gets locked down into the down position. Uh, they do not raise the gear back up. So they're more of a backup for an emergency landing where you maybe have lost hydraulic system number three. Uh, system number three has input into the left and right inboard brakes and the landing gear extension and retraction and also nose wheel steering. So that's your big system for landing gear and brakes. So let's take a look at that real quick. As you can see, uh, we have left and right inboard brakes, we have nose wheel steering, and we have, let's see, main landing, nose gear, landing gear, landing gear, nose, nose landing gear right here. And uh, that's it. That's how the system works. And then uh, over on system number two, you have the outboard brakes. And somewhere down in here, you should have uh, left and right main landing gear assist actuators. Okay, so there's all your components for the uh, landing gear. Uh, there's five of them in total. Three of them are usually really required. And uh, number two, what's over on number two? Consider that as a backup, except for maybe your outdoor uh, outboard brakes. But hopefully, we don't have to rely rely on those 100% because we do still have reverse thrust. We can slow the aircraft down using that, and we still have brakes uh, on system number three for the inboard brakes. All 
planning gear, a proximity, uh, proximity sensing electronic unit, we call it PSEU, controls the landing gear. Well, what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you what, it's just another computer uh, that monitors and uh, identifies what's going on with the uh, landing gear. Then we have each main landing gear uh, equipped with multi-disc brakes. Well, like I say, covered the multi-disc brakes uh, more towards the end of the uh, lecture here. And uh, we have anti-skid control system. And uh, we have the nose wheel steering provides directional control on the ground. So there we are. Those are your major components of the uh, landing gear. And uh, then of course on your ICAST panel number one, you would have your indicators as to whether or not the gear was up or down or in transit or somehow failed to be in the proper position uh, based on the selection of the landing gear hand. Flight deck controls and monitoring. Well, this is always important. There are quite, quite a few uh, items on the flight deck that uh, would be associated with landing gear. Let's talk about a few of them here and where they're located. As you can see, these are our enlarged view of our switches and our panels that are related to the uh, uh, landing gear. Uh, this switch here is located right here on the panel uh, to the uh, left of the captain. And uh, it is the on off switch. Just think of it as on off switch for uh, whether or not you're going to be able to use the tiller, all right? So if the hydraulic switches were turned on, uh, what you do not want to have happen is uh, inadvertently have this switch to the arm position and then end up moving your tiller right or left because if there is a nose gear, uh, a, 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 a tow bar attached to the nose gear, what would happen if the tow bar was not attached to a tug, uh, then the tow bar is out there able to swing freely right or left if the nose is turned right or left. And if you had the uh, nose uh, wheel steering switch in the arm position and hydraulic power applied to it at the same time, and you bump this tiller, you're going to have that uh, tow bar swinging right or left. If there's somebody standing outside within the arc of that tow bar, you're going to uh, basically take their legs right out from underneath them. It's been known that uh, these tow bars have been able to break people's legs who were inadvertently in the way of when this might occur. So it's a real safety issue. You wanna make sure that uh, when you're parked at the, uh, at the gate uh, that that switches in the off position for safety reasons. Some jets have a bypass valve with a flag on it that uh, is pinned, uh, pins the hydraulic system out of play so that only the ground crew can actually release it and, and let it uh, let this uh, nose wheel uh, move uh, via the tiller. But in this aircraft, you actually have a switch in the cockpit that replaces the uh, pin and the flag. So it's incumbent on the pilots to make sure they know what's going on with that switch. So that switch remains off until you get pushed off the gate and uh, then uh, the tow bar is released and then you would turn the switch on. Okay, so let's talk about the tiller. Everybody's always interested. Well, what's this strange looking thing over here? And it's located right here to the left of the captain. Yes, the first officer does not get to steer the aircraft when it's on the ground. Uh, that's the captain's thing. I'll tell you what, it's kind of a treat to, once you make it over into that seat to be that guy that's actually driving the airplane around on the ground. So uh, that being the case, uh, captain gets to steer the airplane. Uh, that tiller will move the nose gear uh, 80 degrees left and right. Uh, and uh, if the uh, first officer were wanted to steer the aircraft, he would be limited to... Uh, restricted movement of the nose gear through the pedals, uh, right or left. Don't forget that the top of the pedals work just like the top of the pedals on your Cessna 172. If you push down at the top, 
you will be applying brake pressure so the aircraft would stop moving uh, in the forward position. Now, here's a key that uh, we learned. We used to do power backs with the engines. You would never step on the brake pedals powering back because what would happen is the brakes would lock up and the nose of the aircraft would come way up off the ground and you could actually get a tail, st tail strike just uh, backing out of the gate. So you had to use a lot of caution. But how you uh, handled uh, the brakes on this aircraft doing a power back. Generally speaking, most airlines have gotten to the place where they use tugs to push the aircraft off of the gate. Down here we have the, uh, the brake handle. The brake handle is located right here on the center forward aft portion of the uh, center console. Uh, it's located next to the captain because the captain's normally the person taxiing the aircraft, of course. And when he comes to a stop, he would uh, depress the brake pedals, pull up on the uh, brake handle, rotate it 90 degrees, at least on this aircraft, and uh, then the brake, the aircraft would be uh, stopped in position with the parking brake on. If you want to continue to taxi, you would push on the top of the pedals and uh, rotate the handle back to the horizontal position, push it down, and now the aircraft is no longer uh, has the parking brake on, so you can continue to taxi. This handle over here is the emergency uh, gear extension handle. It is found right next to the parking brake. And uh, the way that works is it's gravity that, that if you had to say, for example, the hydraulic system number three uh, failed and you wanted to get the landing gear down. So you'd reach over, you'd pull this handle up, push in on the button, pull it up, and then that would release uh, the locking mechanisms on the gear. And then the gear would free fall. And uh, then of course, system number two would back up and make, uh, with its hydraulic actuators, uh, would push the gear into the lock position. Um, Let's move on up here. This is always the interesting panel right up here. This is your landing gear panel. If you've not been in a retractable gear aircraft, you'll notice that uh, the gear selector handle always has a wheel as the, uh, as the knob for the uh, selector handle. So that identifies it as being landing gear. So we do not operate the landing gear when the aircraft is on the ground, unless it's in a maintenance shop for some reason maybe up on jacks and they have to raise the landing gear up and down just to check its operation to make sure it's uh, safe for service. Uh, and this whole panel is found right down here. Okay, so that should take care of most of the uh, items in the uh, flight deck that operate uh, the landing gear and braking system. Let's talk about the uh, nose gear. Uh, the nose gear consists of two wheels. It uh, retracts forward. In other words, it moves up and forward into the nose wheel well. There's a reason for that primarily that if you ever had to uh, extend it using gravity, uh, then the uh, air flowing past the wheel push, would push it rearward and uh, lock it uh, into position. That's a one-time operation. You're going to get one shot at it if your hydraulic system number three has failed for some reason. Okay, uh, it consists of uh, two side to hinging doors and one rear door. Uh, locks in both the extended and the retracted position by spring locks and an over-centering mechanism. Hydraulic actuators uh, move the over-centering mechanism to retract and lower the gear. So in this picture right here, uh, you would see a locking mechanism right here. As the actuator pulls up, it releases the locking mechanism. And now the uh, scissor link or the uh, linkage mechanism uh, can be folded and the gear retracted uh, up into the nose gear. So this is a cylinder right here. I believe that's the another cylinder used to actually uh, move the nose gear left and right. 
So, moving on. The main landing gear is uh, retracts uh, inward instead of forward. It retracts inward into the fuselage of the aircraft. There are no gear doors on this. Uh, the uh, gear doors remain uh, open when, well, actually the gear doors remain open when the gear is extended. On some big jets, uh, the landing gear comes out, goes down, and then the gear doors come back up to uh, streamline the lower portion of the wing and the fuselage uh, and also gets them out of the way from touching the ground. In this aircraft, the uh, uh, design is uh, quite a bit simpler. So when the uh, landing gear is extended, the gear doors remain open. Uh, just the way they designed it, simple system, works good, lasts a long time. Gear doors uh, make a smooth surface uh, covering the strut, but do not enclose the wheel. So if you were to look here, uh, at the lower drawing right here, you see looking up from underneath the aircraft in flight, the uh, the wheels are actually viewable. Uh, they have no gear doors over the top of the wheels themselves. The wheels themselves bear against the bottom side of the fuselage and allow the airstream to pass over the wheels fairly smoothly. No point in having on this aircraft uh, an elaborate uh, gear door system that has to be retracted. Just more stuff to go wrong uh, with the gear. The gear is held up uh, in position by mechanical uplinks. So once it retracts, uh, mechanical uplinks lock it into place. So if you had a, a hydraulic failure, the gear is just not going to drop down that uh, those mechanical uplinks would hold it in the up position. The uh, gear is held in the down position by an over-centering mechanism and some springs. So here's your springs right here. And you can see them down in this picture. Give you some reference as to where they're at. So uh, they uh, somehow pull on some uh, linkage here that locks the, uh, the strut down into position. And uh, then of course, when the act actuator is uh, operated to raise the gear, it would pull against the springs, open up the, uh, locks and the gear would be able to be raised up into the gear. Okay, all of this operates hydraulically and uh, without hydraulic system number three, it doesn't operate at all. So here's what happens when you uh, are looking at your ICAS uh, number one and seeing what the, the uh, landing gear system is uh, doing. So in the up position, you would see up on all three gear. Uh, that would match up with where the handle was uh, positioned. So you position the handle up. And when the gear is up and stowed, you would have white up. When uh, you select the gear lever to the down position and the gear then moves into the down and locked position, you would have the down and green enunciated. When uh, the uh, you have an amber box on each one of those locations, that tells you that the gear is simply in transit. It's moving. It's not quite made it to the position that the gear handle is selected. Give it a few seconds, and it should be either up or down, depending on where you have the gear handle selected. Red indicates that the landing gear is unsafe. So if you uh, select gear up and uh, you get two whites and a red, for example, on the nose gear, you'd know that the nose gear didn't get to the selected position. And uh, in other words, it's what we call a disagreement light. And if you have a dashed li uh, line down here, uh, it simply says that, hey, maybe the sensors on the gear are not able to detect whether the gear is up or down. So those might be a micro switch issue. Uh, you'd have maintenance come out and look at it. Hopefully it's something that simple that it's just a micro suit. Uh, it could be an indication with your uh, PSEU. Uh, let man uh, let uh, maintenance handle the problem. We're not mechanics. We're not trained to even have to troubleshoot on this stuff. So. So we talked about the gear disagree. Um, 
as you can see, the gear disagree is uh, enunciated up here as well as down here. So since this is a, a red disagree uh, indication, we would go ahead and get our QRH out and uh, read the QRH uh, as a checklist and uh, basically read and do what it says to do. And if we cannot resolve the problem, then we probably uh, be landing gear up in this case, at least on the nose gear. So that's not gonna make your day go well. Uh, it's gonna require some paperwork after you've landed and scraped up the uh, bottom side of your aircraft. Uh, so at any rate, uh, not a good thing to have uh, that you wanna see on an aircraft of any type. Landing gear lever operation. This has always been kind of my favorite topic. Uh, uh, so what it amounts to is that uh, up is up, of course, and down is down. When you're at the gate, that handle better be down. If it's not down, I'm going to leave the cockpit immediately. I don't want to be that guy that happened to have a gear up while I was at the gate. So that, that handle better not be up. It better be down whenever you're on the ground. The only time it can be up, as I said, was when maintenance might be having the aircraft in the hangar up on jacks and they're doing a swing test on the gear and then they need to see how well the gear is operating, make sure it's safe for service. Um, this uh, gear handle actually is set up to where you are not supposed to be able to raise it while you're on the ground. The weight on a wheel solenoid, there's a solenoid lock in behind this gear handle that locks the gear in the down position, okay? So weight on wheels uh, sends the signal to that solenoid to keep that gear handle locked so that you cannot move it to the up position. When you get weight off wheels, in other words, you've taken off, you're in the air, then you have weight off wheel signals, the solenoid lock to release, and then allows you to select the up position on the handle. There are times when you would reach over there after you've taken off, try to raise the handle and it won't come up. Well, that's because probably the solenoid itself has failed. And so that's why they give us a bypass system on this uh, gear handle. The bypass system is right here. You push that little red button in and then you can uh, push the solenoid lock out of the way and then raise the landing gear and continue on your way without having to return to the aircraft. Costs a lot of people uh, their schedule trying to make a meeting or make another connection on another flight. So the goal is to get them to where their destination is. And uh, this is not unsafe. It just means that the solenoid lock has failed and you've had to bypass it. Hydraulic system uh, three versus system number two. So what is the difference between system number one and system number two? Well, hydraulic uh, gear actuators are normally powered by the hydraulic system number three. So landing gear up, landing gear down, that's all done through the hydraulic pressure from hydraulic system number three. If system number three fails to lower the gear, the emergency gear handle can be pulled and the pressure from system number three is dumped. This allows the gear to free fall. It also pulls the, uh, the locks out of the way, the, the gear up locks out of the way. And that is done simply by pulling the emergency gear extension handle right here. So when you pull that up, hydraulic system uh, three pressure is dumped and the locks are taken off so the gear can free fall. And in addition to that, on system number two, we have uh, some little actuators that can push the gear into the final final lock position. And uh, so let's just take a look. I think we can see it on this. Zoom right in here. That should do it. Okay, so uh, let me get rid of this. So, uh, 
On system number three, if it was operating, it's showing here that's not operating. Let's say it's lost pressure, but in this case, let's say it's got normal pressure. So you can see where the landing gear would be operated by system number three, and nose wheel steering is also operated by system number three. And up here you have inboard brakes being operated by system number three. Now it's odd here because they're showing the brake pressure at 3000 PSI, but they're showing system pressure at 500. Now, why might that be a case? Well, if you remember back in the hydraulic uh, systems uh, module, uh, we had these accumulators and they were brake accumulators. So the brakes would be able to maintain pressure at least for a certain period of time. So when you got, got on the ground, you might still have accumulator, accumulator brake pressure, although the uh, system number three uh, had de depleted substantially, you'd still have a fair amount of braking just on system number three alone. So there's your three items for system number three, but on system number two, that's our backup system we said. So it also has brake pressure for the outboard brakes, but it has this right down here, landing gear alternate extension. And what that amounts to is uh, the cylinders uh, can be powered briefly by landing gear, uh, by hydraulic system number two, uh, forced to force the gear into position for landing and lock them down that way uh, in case they just don't free fall all the way into position. So it's kind of a backup just to make darn sure that the landing gear did get locked down when we did the emergency gear extension. Landing gear warning horn. Uh, this is uh, this works real good, lasts a long time. If you get to hear this, it's because you made a, a serious error somewhere on the final approach segment of your flight, and uh, the aircraft is telling you, hey, do you really want to land with the gear up? So you'll have a gear warning horn. Tells you that the gear is not in the down and locked position. Now, how does it do this? Well, uh, the aircraft monitors your airspeed and it monitors your flap configuration. And it takes a look at where your landing gear position is. If the landing gear is out of position based on what the approach airspeed might be and what the flap position is and the thrust lever position is, uh, the gear warning horn is going to enunciate. And it's uh, rather an annoyance if you miss that horn going off uh, and you land gear up, somebody's going to have some splaining to do. So when that horn is going off, it means you've made two mistakes if you landed gear up. The first one was that you didn't get the gear down when you were supposed to. The second one is that you completely ignored the gear warning horn. So you have a couple shots of getting the gear down. Plus, you've got two pilots on there. So hopefully, gear up landings never happen with a commercial uh, aircraft unless it was an intended gear up landing. Uh, so on this particular slide, you can see where you can flip this uh, guard up and mute the landing uh, horn. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, uh, let's say you were doing a, a flyby down the runway at a slow speed for photography purposes or something like that, or you were out doing some stalls and you decided to do uh, some low speed stalls uh, flap uh, position uh, is uh, down and you wanted to leave the gear up, that might be where you'd mute the uh, warning horn so you didn't have to listen to it while you're doing some sort of maneuver. Uh, other than that, you would normally go ahead and uh, not mute the landing one horn. Okay, also you have right here, uh, while it's up here, the anti-skid uh, switch. So you can see that uh, it's in the arm position. That's where we want it to when we're landing so that the anti-skid can operate. Uh, if we have it off, we're landing without anti-skid. Bad things can happen. The wheels can lock up. You can start uh, peeling rubber off the tires. You can actually blow tires out doing this. So if I'm landing, I want the uh, anti-skid armed. In fact, I can't think of when this switch would be in the off position except for maintenance. Okay. Of course, you have the main landing gear, overheat, uh, and overheat test. We don't normally mess with those 
that's a given that they're going to work. So uh, hopefully they do. And we will move on. Nose wheel steering. Nose wheel steering is enabled when the system is armed. In other words, remember that switch over just to the left of the captain? That uh, switch has to be in the arm position. And we have weight on wheels. So that's a priority a requirement. Uh, so if you don't have weight on wheels, you cannot turn your tiller. And the gear has to also be down locked. So three conditions have to occur. The system has to be armed with the captain's uh, steering wheel switch armed. You have to have weight on wheels and you have to have the gear down and locked. So why is it that we have to have weight on wheels for the uh, to be able to turn the wheels on the ground? Or Well, first of all, it's if you did not have weight on wheels as a factor and you were in the air and the landing gear were down, if you turn the wheel, the steering wheel at that point, and now you're turning the nose gear, and then you go ahead and raise the landing gear at the same time, and the nose wheel is cocked at an angle, it could jam up uh, before it gets into the uh, the wheel well bay, and that would not be a good thing. So they want that uh, wheel to center itself, and to do that, they make sure they take it out of the uh, system so it can self-center before it actually comes up into the uh, wheel well. So that's the purpose for it. Uh, weight on wheels uh, to allow the wheel to self-center once you're off the ground or bringing the wheel down out of the, out of the wheel well when you're getting ready to land. So just the safety factors, fe features of the wheel that allow that to occur. Now the question is, you've seen uh, airplanes uh, turn very sharply out of the uh, gate and they, they like turn on a dime, so to speak. Well, they can do that quite simply because uh, the steering tiller on the captain's side can actually move the wheel to 80 degrees either side of center line, and that tiller is intended for loads, low speed taxiing, like on the taxiways or uh, just making a sharp turn, getting out of the gate, uh, making a 90 degree, 90 degree turn off off of the runway. Other than that, uh, when you're uh, moving along at a rather high rate of speed, you're going to want to be using the pedals. This would be like for takeoff or landings. Uh, you can use the pedals for a high speed exit if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, think of it this way. Normally uh, above 60 knots, you would use the pedals. Anything below 60 knots, you might use the pedals. And uh, when you're going maybe 40 knots or less, something like that, then you'd start using the tiller. Unless you had to make a really sharp turn and there's no reason to make a really sharp turn going 40 knots. You'll probably uh, wipe out the uh, nose gear right up from underneath the aircraft, or you'll certainly um, rub the uh, tires right off the uh, the wheels. So uh, anyway, uh, that's captain's prerogative, how that is operated. Let him take responsibility for that. If bad things happen when he's got his hand on the tiller, you can always say, well, I, I tried to explain it to him. Uh, however, uh, that's how this works. The important caveat here is the tiller turns 80 degrees, the nose wheel either side of center line, and the nose wheel or the pedals turn the nose wheel eight degrees either side of center line. Oh, we got an exam question you might want to look into uh, regarding the CRJ 700. If hydraulic system number three is lost, how do you maintain directional control on the ground? Remember, hyd uh, hydraulic system number three controlled uh, nose wheel steering. So how would you control uh, directional control on the ground? Well, you still have your eight degrees, right? Uh, either side of center line. If you did have to make a, a turn uh, a little bit sharper than normal, uh, other than a 90 degree turn, something like that, you can use differential thrust and brakes. The wheel will cant off right or left a few degrees. So uh, not, a, not a big deal. If it's me and I have an issue where I've lost system number three, I'm probably gonna just park the aircraft straight ahead on the runway, call the company, tell them to come out with a uh, tug and a tow bar and uh, tow this aircraft right on into the gate. So that's how I would handle it. Uh, 
kind of normal. If you're a pilot, what you don't want to do is exceed the limitations of the aircraft, break something, and then have to go see the chief pilot office and do some explaining. So main uh, gear uh, wheel braking, let's talk about how that operates. Hydraulic system number two and hydraulic system number three are responsible for providing hydraulic power for braking. The anti-skid is provided by releasing hydraulic pressure when the braking system recognizes that one of its wheels is not rotating the same as the other wheels. So if there's one wheel that starts to slow down, uh, the anti-skid kicks in, releases brake pressure on that wheel to allow that wheel to continue to turn. That's, that's how the anti-skid system works in a nutshell. Well, let's uh, go ahead and uh, look at this a little bit closer. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna come down here and enlarge things. Get over to our schematic. Okay, there we are, that's much better. So you have your brake handle right here. You have your pedals right here. By pushing in on the top of the pedals, of course, you get some braking action. And you have an anti-skid control unit, uh, ASCU. Uh, so that's the brains of the anti-skid. Then uh, you have a box here that indicates hydraulic system number two. And number three is over on this side. Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, kind of flip from the schematics a little bit. Uh, just keep that in mind. I also want you to notice that you uh, it does show the accumulators in the system right here. All right. So those accumulators have a pre-charge to it so that uh, they're your backup hydraulic uh, pressure uh, for the braking system in the event that you were to lose uh, hydraulic uh, system uh, number two or number three. Uh, then you'd have the, uh, the accumulators as a backup to those systems respectively. Um, so let's take a look at uh, system number three. Get rid of circle here. System number three is uh, over here and uh, it provides uh, brake pressure when the, let's say, let's just say it's the uh, pedals. The pedals uh, push down uh, on the first officer side would uh, control the left inboard brake control valve and the uh, left inboard brake control valve here. And actually, I'll tell you what, I got that backwards. Actually, they, they all actually uh, work, all the brake pedals work their respective uh, right or left sides. So take a look at uh, this pedal here. As you can see, it comes down. It uh, left inboard brake control valve comes across here, right outboard brake control valve. And then this pedal is left inboard brake control. So basically the uh, brakes are all hooked up to the brake control valves uh, and cross linked so that they properly work either left or right side. Hydraulic system number two or number three here is actuated uh, by the pedals operating the uh, control valves and it supplies brake pressure on down in this direction. Looks like right down to here to the right inboard anti-skid control valve and left anti-skid control valve. And I think it, uh, yes, it does come over here. The anti-skid uh, box comes down here and you can see it sends a signal over to the anti-skid control valve to allow those to uh, read the rotation of the tires so that the tires rotate all at the same speed. And if one happens to lock up more, then the anti-skid says release pressure uh, through one of these valves for that particular wheel that happens to be locking up. Pretty much that simple. Uh, not gonna get in too in depth other than to understand that that's how it works. Now there are some other things we wanna talk about in addition to anti-skid. Uh, so you have a fuse uh, that, uh, plug right here, basically. So if you were to develop a leak in the hydraulic system, these fuse plugs would uh, block the leak and not let you lose any more hydraulic fluid. Uh, so in this case, uh, looks like the right outboard uh, brake control valve 
if uh, this break were to start uh, losing pressure because of a leak, then this valve would close or fuse would close. And then you would still have it uh, able to provide uh, pressure to another break. So you're not gonna lose your hydraulic pressure uh, just because you have one leaky break. The other thing that's important here to understand is that, uh, let's see if I can show you this. Annie's kid control unit comes down here. Um, okay, so we have a uh, left inboard Annie's kid control valve uh, return line here that takes fluid back up to, uh, in this case, number three hydraulic system. Same way here, comes into the same line. And over on the number two system, uh, you do not, you have the same lines that go back, but there is a difference between them. And let me see if I can explain this to you. So when you park at the gate, what's going to happen is the anti-skid control valve bleeds off pressure. And over a very short period of time on hydraulic system number two, the brakes uh, or the outboard wheels are going to lose pressure because the anti-skid is bleeding off and returning the hydraulic fluid to system number two. That is slightly different than system number three. System number three has uh, the same uh, bleed back, but when you set your parking brake, you shut this shutoff valve right down here. And what that does is it shuts off the uh, bleed back uh, to the reservoir and it allows the system uh, on the inboard wheels to keep the brakes in the locked position at least for as long as you have pressure in the accumulator uh, for system number three. So this accumulator pressure, if your parking brake is set, could last for several hours. Uh, on system number two, it may only last for, may, I don't know, 20 minutes, something like that before the pressure bleeds off and you have no brake pressure available to the outboard brakes. So parking brake is set and it's going to be, uh, it's gonna hold pressure on the inboard when there's no hydraulic pressure uh, or no hydraulic power uh, provided on the aircraft. So that's how it holds the uh, position of the aircraft. Uh, normally, however, you're always going to put chocks uh, under the main gear uh, when the aircraft is parked at the gate or out on a large stand. So it's kind of a moot point, but uh, that's important to know that system number three does not bleed back uh, if you have the parking brake on, at least for a sub substantial amount of time. Overheat and brake wear. Now this is, uh, this is something you're gonna be doing as a first officer every time you do a walk around. Overheating of a brake system can occur with heavy brake inputs. I actually had a captain do this with me once. Uh, he wanted to get back. We, we were flying to St. Louis uh, and uh, he was flying the aircraft. And we had a quick turn in St. Louis. We we're gonna head back to Atlanta. He wanted to get back to Atlanta so he could catch the, uh, the bus going to the parking lot from the terminal. And he knew exactly what bus he wanted to catch, the one that left at 15 minutes past the hour. So we zoom into uh, St. Louis and uh, to get to the gate quicker, he decided he'd take an early exit on the runway. He gets on the brakes extremely uh, hard, gets the aircraft stopped so he can make the turn off. And now we're going to turn in right towards the gate. We're gonna save ourselves maybe five minutes of taxi time. This is so he can get back and catch his uh, ride to the parking lot uh, that he was trying to catch. So we get to the gate. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do the walk around. Now keep in mind, I'm trying to catch a commute home and it was gonna leave maybe 40 minutes after we get back to St. Louis. So the problem is 
he lives in St. Louis and I got to catch a commute. If he doesn't catch his bus ride to the parking lot, he has to wait an extra 15 minutes. If I don't catch my commute home, I have to wait an extra six hours. We get to the gate uh, in St. Louis. Uh, he goes and gets his coffee or whatever he's doing. I do the walk around and I, before I get out, I can see what's going on with the brake temperatures. And the brake temperatures are rising rapidly. And if they exceed a certain limit, that means we have to wait for 45 minutes before we can push the airplane off the gate and take off because you can't take off with hot brakes. So I was a little annoyed by that because I could see the temperature getting extremely close to, uh, to the uh, red line for being able to not get off the uh, gate in a reasonable amount of time and having to wait for this temperature to cool back down. Could have taken 45 minutes and I would have missed my commute. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, he could have missed his uh, ride to the parking lot 10 times over. At any rate, no point in getting in a hurry on these brakes. It's not going to save you any time or money if you overheat them. They can actually cost you a lot of time. So don't overheat your brakes. I have some other caveats to this. Uh, overheating brake systems can occur with heavy input on brakes. Uh, there is a fusible plug in the wheel each wheel that will deflate the tires uh, on the main gear to prevent a tire rupture during excessive overheating of the brakes. So if these brakes really overheat, you let's, let's say you smoke them. I mean, you get them red hot, literally red hot. There are these fuse plugs on the uh, wheels themselves that will internally melt right here. Actually, I'm sorry, that's not it. It's right here. So that fuse plug is like a lead plug. And uh, if the wheel gets hot enough from overheating on the brakes, that lead plug will melt and it will deflate the tires. If it doesn't, and the tires get excessively hot, the tires can explode, uh, creating a, sh a shrapnel event. So that's why they have fusible plugs in them. And uh, if you'll see this uh, on a video that uh, I'm hoping you will watch towards the end of this video, it will show what happens when brakes overheat on a test that they do on a 747. Uh, they were actually testing it to intentionally to see if they could get the aircraft stopped in the time that they had predicted uh, based on the design of the aircraft. So these fuse plugs actually let go and all the flyers, tires deflate as a result in that video. So that's what happened. I've heard of this happening before. I had it happen to a friend of mine. Uh, they had to do a high speed abort and they locked up the wheels or overheated the brakes, I should say, and then overheating uh, melted all the fuse plugs and the aircraft now sitting on the runway, taking up uh, the runway, not allowing other aircraft to land or take off. So kind of a boo-boo on, on their part for what they did that day. So that's the fusible plug. The brake temperature is monitored on the status page. Uh, in the cockpit of the uh, CRJ-700. And wear pins provide an indication of brake wear on the uh, uh, brake pad wear on the uh, brakes. So these uh, pins, when you do your walk around, I want to see if I can identify them here. Um, I'm going to say right here is a brake pin. And I don't know. I don't see it over here. That may or may not be a pin, but it's just a little pin that sticks out on the inside of the wheel, that uh, if it's flush with the housing, you know that the brake pads have uh, significantly wore down and now it's time to have the brake pads or the brakes removed and replaced with uh, serviceable, serviceable brakes. And uh, that's your job to check that every time you do a walk around. Now, of course, uh, if the uh, brake uh, pin is sticking out a half inch or so, uh, when you initially do the walk around early in the day, not quite so significant, but uh, if it was close to the surface and uh, almost flush, then you'd probably be wanting to check them every time you did a walk around to make sure you had enough brake pad uh, left to get the aircraft stopped. Loss of hydraulic system number one and two. How much braking authority do you have with a loss of either system number one or system two? That's a good question. I'm going to say if you lose one or the other, 
your breaking is going to be roughly half as far as the braking goes on the wheels. Because on this aircraft, system number two controls the outboard wheels. System number two controls the inboard wheels. System number three controls the inboard wheels. In the event of losing power to both hydraulic systems, number two and three, is it even possible to stop the aircraft? Yes or no? So you ask, you say, well, obviously we've got to be able to stop it somehow. So the answer must be yes. So what are your other options to get the aircraft stopped? Well, you have ground spoilers and reverse thrust to slow the aircraft during landing or redirected takeoff. So you're gonna get reverse thrust. That'll help slow you down significantly. Without reverse thrust, you'd be surprised how ineffective the brakes are at getting an aircraft stopped. Uh, you would also want to make sure you get your um, lift spoilers uh, deployed. That's going to reduce lift on the wings and it's also going to force the aircraft down harder on the ground. That'll help slow things down a little bit just by the drag it creates. And don't forget, you still have accumulators on each of the hydraulic uh, systems, one and two, that we've talked about before. And if you do it correctly, they should still have pressure uh, in the aircraft or on the, uh, the respective system. So if you use constant brake pedal, uh, pressure, you should have wheel braking anyway. So a lot of redundancy here. You uh, shouldn't ever have an excuse to run off the air runway. However, I will tell you another story. My son, who's a captain at Delta right now, uh, said that he took off, uh, headed uh, to some outstation uh, from uh, from uh, some, uh, to, well, some little airport out there where they didn't have maintenance or at least competent maintenance. maintenance. And they realized that their reverse thrust on one engine did not uh, function properly when they landed at that little airport. So they called it maintenance, maintenance. They got a maintenance person out there. They uh, did what they uh, they call uh, securing the reverse thrust, uh, pinning it so that it cannot be used. And then that becomes an MEL. And uh, you know you don't have reverse thrust on that one engine. You still have reverse thrust on the other engine. It's quite safe to go ahead and uh, take off and land at another airport. They were happened to be going back to Atlanta. They had a really long runway. So uh, when they got ready to land at Atlanta, everything was going just fine. They touched down and uh, they didn't get any reverse thrust at that point in time. It took up the entire runway to get stopped at Atlanta. Had they been at another little, little airport somewhere else, where the runway was maybe uh, two thirds the length, their aircraft would have been in the grass somewhere. Uh, so he was a little bit concerned about that. When they got out and they um, observed what had happened, they had found out that the maintenance uh, people at the uh, prior airport had pinned both thrust reversers closed so they couldn't be operated, either one. A real serious error could have occurred. Uh, nobody got hurt, fortunately. And, uh, but that was his story about not having reverse thrust and how much longer it took to get the aircraft stopped, used up almost the entire length of the runway. Of course, it caught him by surprise because he thought they had at least one reverse thrust operating. So anyway, reverse thrust is a big deal, uh, more, more so maybe than the brakes. Uh, so braking is not that big a deal or lack of braking. Okay, brake pressure monitoring. Let's take a look at this for a second. You'll see that uh, brake pressure is continuously monitored and displayed on the hydro hydraulic synoptics page. And where is it monitored? Uh, obviously, right here where those arrows are. So when you're looking for brake pressure, don't look down here because that's not where you're going to find it. You're going to find it up here because it is actually backed up with accumulators. So a little different than uh, these. Uh, this pressure here. Uh, indicates what's happening on uh, these items down here. And brake pressure up here is actually measuring brake pressure more so from the accumulators uh, because if you lose this hydraulic pressure, you may still have brake pressure available. Okay. 
Well, let's go back just a second. I forgot to cover something on that prior slide. Uh, let's say uh, break monitoring. Uh, if you get uh, less than 3,000 uh, PS, well, if you're more than 3,000 or right at 3,000, uh, you're going to be in the green. Uh, if you are, it's going to go white. If you go, I think it's uh, 2,000 or 200 pounds over. Uh, so it's uh, normal to be 3,000 pounds plus or minus 200 pounds. Uh, so you could be uh, 2,800 pounds to 3,200 pounds. Everything would be in the green. If you go above or below that, uh, it's going to, if it goes above that, it's going to be white. If it drops below uh, 1,800 PSI, uh, it will go amber. And if you have no indication at all, uh, it means the brake monitoring is not uh, not active. Something's gone wrong. So a sensor or something has failed. So that's how you monitor the brake pressure. And that's what you should be seeing up here. Anti-skid, a function of the anti-skid uh, uh, unit, uh, anti-skid control unit. So I think we talked about this already, but uh, we'll go through it again one more time. Uh, what does anti-skid do? Uh, individual wheels, uh, individual wheel anti-skid control that prevents landing with the brakes applied, and it allows recovery from a deep skid. So. You have a dual anti-skid uh, system right here, and I'm sure we talked about this earlier. So no point in re rehashing it, except that uh, the valves right here in the anti-skid valve are controlled by the anti-skid uh, control unit. And uh, if it senses that one of the wheels is locking up or not turning at the same rate as the other wheels, then that valve would release and let that uh, wheel that's locking up continue to turn normally and then would reapply the braking at that point in time. Parking brake, we talked about that also. So I guess I covered most of this on the prior slide, uh, but we'll just read this. When the parking brakes are set and the hydraulic systems are shut down, pressure slowly leaks away via the anti-skid return lines. Hydraulic system number three, accumulator, will extend the pressure on the appropriate brakes. To set the parking brake, you press the upper pedals uh, of the upper side of the rudder pedals and pull up and turn the uh, brake handle 90 degrees. And that will be shutting this valve right here so that uh, the anti-skid from system number three cannot uh, bleed back to the reservoir. As shown right here. There it is. There's your uh, accumulator. Now let's talk about uh, brakes in general. This is not specific to the CRJ 700. This is kind of generally how brakes work, not part of your AeroSim module, uh, but I like showing these slides because I think it illustrates uh, much better as to what's really going on with your uh, brake drum system. This is a cutaway. This uh, this shows the uh, brake system of a 737. Uh, and as you'll notice, we have several parts to a uh, braking system on this aircraft or on, on this wheel. Uh, thing you need to notice right off the back is terminology. We have rotors and you can remember what a rotor is because it rotates with the wheel so as the wheel turns the rotors are also turning at that same rate of speed you have stators and these are the things that actually carry the brake pads so think of the rotors as being the disc and the stators as being uh, stationary to the landing gear itself and they're the things that actually have the brake pads uh, riveted to them. And of course, you have a wheel bearing, you got an air valve here, no biggie on that. Uh, then you have hydraulic pistons right here. Now, the uh, brake system on, 
on a Boeing 737 is slightly different in that uh, the, both hydraulic systems uh, go to every wheel uh, and they actually actuate every other piston in each wheel. So in this case, uh, we have a piston right here, a little hydraulic piston there and there. And this one here is one. And here's one back here, there. And I think that's one. So what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six uh, hydraulic uh, pistons that are going to actually, when hydraulic pressure is applied to them, push inward on this uh, plate, okay, right here. And it's going to compress all of these stagers and rotors together. And there's going to be multiple of them. Here's the rotors. There's one, two, three, four rotors. And these are stagers. This is one. And so in between each rotor, there would be a stator. And the stagers would look like this. This is the brake pads right here. And you'd have more brake pads on stagers in between the rotors. And when you push all this together, you get a lot of energy absorption capability. And that's what you're doing with brake by braking. You're trying to uh, absorb a lot of heat energy into these pads to get the wheel to stop rotating. Uh, it's friction, okay? Simple as that, just friction. The more of these friction plates you have, the easier it is to get the aircraft stopped. Since this is a really big aircraft, uh, it has quite a few rotors and stators. And uh, one last thing I wanna show you here is this wire pin. We talked about that earlier. And uh, it's attached to the outboard uh, stator plate. And so when the brakes are pushed all, all the way down, this uh, stator plate moves in this direction. And since the pin is attached to it right here, the pin moves inward. And as soon as it gets flush with the, the housing, uh, this outer housing here, then you know you've pretty much used up all your brake pads. And that's something you do, again, anytime you do a walk around on one of these aircraft. That's what the uh, brake drums look like when they are on a trunnion or a landing gear. The wheels obviously are not shown here. As you can see, you can see the rotors right here. And then there's stators. So if there's one, two, three, four rotors, there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, five or six uh, stagers, I guess. So uh, note the multiple uh, disc brake cylinders around the wheels. There they are. You can see them right there. And uh, on the 7.3, this might be the left side hydraulic system. This might be the right side hydraulic system. Every other one on the CRJ 700, they just uh, have the systems on entirely separate wheels. So just a different way of doing it. Uh, works good, lasts a long time, doesn't really matter how the engineers have it figured out, how they want to do it. Okay, on this, uh, we have eight hydraulic driven pistons, uh, looks like on these wheels, and you have four wheels. This whole system here, uh, by the way, is called a bogey. So when you have a, um, more than two wheels, like uh, four wheels arranged this way on one landing gear. The landing gear is called the bogey, not just the landing gear. That's the uh, brake pads uh, and stators all separated. This is a uh, this is a stator, as we said, stationary, and there's a rotor, and it rotates, and with the wheel and the stator stay stationary. You press all this together with hydraulic pressure and the wheels come to a screeching halt. Okay, now what I want you to do, and uh, I'm not able to do it here for you, uh, I want you to click uh, or swipe over this, copy this uh, address, put it into your uh, um, bar up there at the top uh, so you can view this video. And this video is going to be watching them do a test on a 747 braking system, make sure that the aircraft can stop in the appropriate distance. It does uh, show where the fuse plugs get melted because the brakes get so hot. It's a really good video. It's not that long. It's about uh, maybe 
uh, seven minutes long, I think is what uh, I recall. But anyway, look at that video and uh, that'll give you a real good uh, shot at what's going on with the braking systems on these really large aircraft. So really that's all I got to say, except that go to the brake uh, and uh, gear module uh, in your AeroSim, review it, get through the whole thing, answer the questions at the end of the module, hit uh, sync at the end. Uh, so I know you viewed it. Remember you're getting points for doing this. And uh, in the meantime, all I've really got to say is I love my job. Glad to be here. Hope I can make a difference. See you next time.